topic that came up last year. I don't know if it's applicable to anyone, but I'll put this out here. Just you know, it's good for understanding, and it will also help you understand what it means for aligning data. So time series modeling is a very well studied topic outside latent variable methods. It's not a latent variable topic by any means. It's a standalone subject. And the standard reference textbook from that is Box and Jenkinson's book. Um, but the book by Chatfield is also very good if this is something that's of interest to you. And people use these time series models a lot in the economics community for forecasting. So they do it to make predictions of future sales given input there, inputs here about the target market, they will then predict future sales. Or in chemical processes, we'll treat this in, in the usual way, but these inputs are the variables to our process that we can measure and control and manipulate, and the Y would be the predictive uh, value that's of interest to us. Okay. And the important part from time series that's the different that you've seen before is that time series will often lag the incoming data. So in our, up to now in this course, we've only used data that's measured at the same point in time to predict our output. But what time series models say and point out to us is that it may not be your current value of x that's most predictive of your future y. Maybe it's x the previous time step. So let's take our data sampled one hour apart. Our, y, our current x value may not be predictive of y, but our x value an hour ago maybe is much more related to y, or x two hours ago is more strongly related to y. And that's just because we have time delays in our process. So yes, we make this input in x, but by the time we see the change happening in y, two hours have passed through this complicated system in, in this box over here. So it doesn't always make sense to line up the data exactly at the same time point. We may actually need to shift some of the data around a bit to get this alignment much more strong. And we're going to see how we can do that with PCA and PLS. And then we'll actually have a little case study we can work on a bit. So to help understand what we're doing here, let's just take a, a very simple transfer function. I'm assuming uh, most of you have done a course in process control and have seen that terminology over there. If you haven't, it doesn't really matter. What we're just saying is we're going to convert this Laplace transform back to the time domain and we get a differential equation. This differential equation is the model for, for a very simple first order system which says that if I give it an input x, my output y, and let's say my x is a step, so I change x from some low value to a high value, my output y is initially going to be whatever it was and then it's going to respond in that fashion. So that's a typical first order response that you see. That response is modeled by this differential equation. Given that input x multiplied by a constant gain k, I can predict my output y and it's a function of the derivative of y. So if I rearrange it and I sample with delta t time units apart, I get that, that function form. Okay. So it says my y at a particular time t is a function of x at a particular time t. But y at time t is also a function of y one sample ago. Okay. So my previous sample of y is actually very predictive of my, my next sample of y, and I've got this constant delta in front, which is given by that. And in general, we can write for more complicated systems. This is just the first order system, but for those of you that have taken a process control course with uh, Dr. Schwartz, you, you would have seen this notation. For the general form, we can write our output response y at a particular time t as a function of y at previous time steps. So a1 is coefficient multiplied by y one hour ago, a2 multiplied by y, that should be two hours ago minus two, up to a certain number of points. We don't go back so far in time, we only go back a certain amount. And then we also have our inputs x. So d0 times x t b1 x t minus 1 and so on. So our, our prediction is a function of past y's as well as current and past x's. Now if we wanted to try and accommodate this in a latent variable model, 
I'm going to use this simple example that I had over here, this first order example where our equation is yt is delta times yt minus 1. So yt is equal to some coefficient times y, one time step ago, plus b0 times xt. That b0 coefficient is really just this term over here, k times 1 minus d minus delta times xt. So for that very simple case, our prediction of y times t is a function of y one time sample ago. So we actually go back in time one row in our data set, and we take that entry and we copy it over to our x space in the same row. And then y of t, which we're going to predict here on in our y space, in our y vector, is also a function of x at time t. So x at times t times some coefficient b0, which we don't, we don't know that coefficient just yet. But then there's also y one time step back and its corresponding coefficient. So if we wanted to build this model, we can just take our column of y and copy and paste it over to our x space and shift it one, one, one row down. That will bring, within each row, we'll have that consistency. Is that clear? And it looks a little bit confused, yeah. And how many columns do you split to you In this particular example, we know the system to be first order. We know if we, from our differential equation and writing it here in discrete form that y of t is a function of y t minus 1 only. Oh. But if, say, this process was a second order system, we would find a coefficient times yt minus 1 and another coefficient times yt minus 2. And in general, for every order of the system, we'll have an additional lag back in, back in on the, on the right-hand side of the here. And in many cases, we don't know what the true order of the system is. So we'll talk about that in a minute, what would you do in that case. But for the cases where we do know, the relationship, the expected theoretical relationship between y and its previous uh, lags, we can go add as many of those columns into the x space as necessary. So we'll usually start just with a single lag. So in the software, we'll, I'll show you in a minute, we'll go add one lag of y over to the x space. We can go add a second lag and a third lag later on and try subsequent models and see how, how they improve. So the important thing is, it doesn't matter how we how we do this, or, or as long as within a row, everything that's within that row is consistently related to the output of y of t. That's the that's the critical point with lagging the time series model. Now, coming back to this question of how many lags should go into the x space, one way to do it is if you go and take the y variable and you use R, there's the autocorrelation function. If you've got MATLAB's time series toolbox, you can get its autocorrelation function. And the autocorrelation function is a way to find out how strongly a variable is related with itself. That's what the prefix auto means, is self in Greek. So autocorrelation, how strongly related is the variable with itself? And at lag zero, the variable is always related with itself 100%. Okay. What that simply means is that if I plot y sampled at time t as a scatter plot against y sampled at time t, I'm going to get a straight line with the points lying exactly on the line, which is to be expected. Okay? So this autocorrelation function is showing how self-correlated is the variable with itself at a differing number of lags. So at lag zero, the variable is obviously 100% correlated with itself. If I go lag the variable one time sample, yt minus one, and I plot it against yt, here's my y data over here on the right hand side, and I go plot that lag, I'm still going to get a positive correlation with a strength of roughly 75%. So now I'm not going to get a 45 degree line perfectly, but I'm definitely going to get a strong correlation which when I calculate the R squared or R value for it, I go 
to get a number of about 75% strength. Okay. And as I go change this to two lags, I look at that, that line over there, that the relationship of the variable with itself becomes weaker and weaker. Until a point where I get within this limit over here. And those blue limits are just the confidence limit for the correlation coefficient. In other words, lags four, five, and so on within these in these bounds are really not significant. There's a little bit of a peak to a negative lag, showing at lag six and seven, the variable is slightly negatively correlated with itself. But for the most extent, we can see this variable y is strongly correlated with itself up to three lags, one, two, and three are significant lags. So in this case, I would lag y three times in the x space, is what I would learn from this ACF function. That's one way of figuring out the number of lags to use. The other approach is just brute force go add a whole lot of lags to your X space and go look at your loading plot. So here I plotted for one variable, I went and lagged it 20 times. So there were other, other variables in the data set that I left there as unlagged, but this particular variable, uh, I'm sorry, my, my X space consisted of other X variables, but then my Y, sorry, I went and lagged 20 times into my X space. And my coefficient plot shows that the same, same structures I see there in the autocorrelation function. And again, I would say, well, here, three lags would be useful to keep in, in my model, because those are the three, uh, three weights that are, are certainly the strongest. Okay. Any questions on, on that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one question is about the um, selection of the sample time, what can you find information about that? And the other thing is, uh, when you are doing, uh, when you are lagging the variables, right? Do you, like in neutral practice, I mean, do you take the, the actual value or do you take uh, average value of the, in the sample time? Those are, uh, that whether one uses an average or the actual value, I'll talk about that when we come to our case study because it has exactly that feature. The question on the sampling time to use is, 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 can be answered as follows. If I take a look at this particular y here, it's plotted as a function of time here. If I double my sampling time, I'm going to basically take the average of the two variables, of the two se sequential points every time with each other. What will happen in that case is my lag plot will basically just, just uh, spread out or, or, or be averaged as well. So now if I'm doubling my sampling duration, I will see this first lag as being strong because now these two will go into the same sampling period. And then that one may or may not stand on its own. I, I'm not 100% sure. Probably it will be close to insignificant. So in this case, I would say I only have one significant lag. So your sampling time very much affects your results. Every time you change your sampling time, you're gonna to have to readjust your, your X matrix. So again, your choice of sampling time is a, is a critical parameter in, in control system design or soft sensor analysis. The way I see it is if I'm building a soft sensor, I first settle that question from a process control point of view. Because for soft sensors, invariably you're using them for feedback control. So you can answer that question by just knowing how fast you're going to be applying feedback control. Once your sampling time is set, then you go ahead and do all your work. But it's not a trivial question to answer because as you can expect, changing the length of that sampling time, you're going to, you're going to start to collect information and smear it over, over a grouping of variables. Smaller sampling time, you're going to get more resolution, um, but you're going to have to maybe add many more lags. The other lagging we, we sometimes do is for our X variables. So I spoke about moving our Y variables and lagging those into the X space. But many times our processes have such long mixing times or time delays in them that XT may not be most strongly related to Y, but maybe X at one or two hours ago, if I'm sampling at one hour intervals, is much more strongly related to Y because of the long residence time or maybe long mixing in the reactor, that it takes a while before the effect of X shows up on Y. So 
So I would have to lag x by one or more time units to get uh, a, a stronger or a better model of y than if I had just left x by itself. Again, yeah, if you're not sure how many lags to add of your x variable, just go add several and then go look at the corresponding coefficients and uh, w star c plus to figure out which lags have strong, strong values. So here's an example where my y variable, this is a w star c plot, so this is my c part for my y space, and then these are the w, the weights. And it's clear that lags 3 and 4 and 5 and 2, to some extent, are, are doing the most work in predicting that. So I could exclude the data from my, my x data unlagged, and my x data with one lag, I probably don't need those in the model. But here's what's far more important in this particular case is x at 2, 3, 4, and 5 lags. And then I don't really need the other lags again. You have, if you have several x's coming into your process, you'd have to go and try out that different lagging lengths for each one of your x's. So if I had x1, x2, and x3 coming in, I'd have to go investigate multiple lags of x1, multiple lags of x2, and multiple lags of x3 uh, if I'm unsure of, of it. In some situations, from a theoretical knowledge or from your engineering experience on the process, your engineers in the past may have put the step response in, in x1 and then measured in y that there's a certain time delay. So, this dotted line is when the step actually took place, but then your response in Y only starts to show up after a certain time delay, theta. And then you can go say, well, theta is, let's say, is equal to five hours. My delta T is equal to one hour. So it implies I need five lags. So if you have that theoretical knowledge from your process, you can certainly go and use that. But many times we don't have that, that built-in knowledge. So we just go and lag each of our x's many times and then look at the corresponding coefficients and loading supplies. This is all really we do this with the hope that we're going to improve our prediction of y. That's how I see soft senses. You can go do any type of pre-processing on your x data, lagging, scaling, transformations, different centering, anything that will improve your Y predictions uh, is fair game in my mind for, for soft senses. Okay, so really this whole section on advanced pre-processing we've looked at so far today, these are all different things you can go and try and make yourself to make your soft sense better. Uh, and then the note down here at the bottom is, we're gonna see this in the case study coming up, but sometimes see up, let's say the theoretical true time delay from this x variable to y is at three lags. It's not uncommon in PLS to see in your, in your W plot that it smears that weight over the surrounding lags. PLS isn't going to give strong weight to L3 and then leave L2 and L4 and L5 here with small coefficients. Anyone know why it won't do that? We'll come to it in a minute, but L2, the variable L2 is, is the same as L3, just shifted down by one time unit. And L4 is the same as L2, shifted down by two time units. So these L2, L3, L4, L5, they're very strongly correlated with each other. Okay, and what PLS does, when it sees a group of correlated variables, it spreads its weight through all of those. It doesn't just pick out the one that it, that's related to y, because it doesn't know that the true lag is three time units, but it sees this group of variables all having strong relationship to the y, so it smears out that weight across all the variables. The other problem is if I do introduce L2, 3, 4, and 5, I'm introducing four new variables into my x space, I may have to block scale that in order to prevent it from swapping the models very I'll skip this out. This is more just a, a side topic. It's very there's too many too much text that put enough text there for you to figure that one out. Um, 
and then spectral data. Anyone dealing with spectral data in this in this class? Near infrared spectral information. I'm not a near infrared or a spectral person at all. I have very minimal experience with spectral data, but every time I read journal articles on spectral data, I see they have their own whole way of uh, pre-processing their data. You'll see these topics, savitsky golay filtering, multiplicative scatter correction, standard normal variance and transformations. And they do an interesting thing. Sometimes they take the first derivative of the spectrum with respect to the wavelength. So take to follow one spectrum along and, and take the first derivative of that. They'll replace the, that raw data with the first derivative, or they'll augment the original data with the first derivative data, basically double the size of the X matrix. Because it's not always just the, the numerical value, that's the rate of change that's important. Um, so if there's anyone uh, dealing with this and, or wants a project topic, I'll be happy to read any project that's going to teach me more about spectral data. And there's tons of it freely available. I've got a lot of it available, and on the internet there's, there's a lot of it freely available as well. So there's no shortage of spectral data, but I, I personally don't understand all these methods, and it would be an interesting topic for someone to research, if it's going to be useful. And then finally, uh, we'll take a look at this in a little bit more detail in, in a class or two from now. Sometimes we deal with data that's, that's pretty tough to, to model. For example, one challenging problem that I was recently asked to think a little bit about was, Let's say I'm playing the violin. Now, I don't play the violin, but if I did, I would record the sound as a function of time. And then let's say she finally played the violin, and then Meow played it. The same song on the violin, we'd all get different spectral signatures in time of how we're playing it. One way to model that is to take the Fourier transform of what we're playing. Rather than take the time domain data, I may play the same song as Meow and Chifali, but I'm going to take three minutes, Meow may take three minutes and 10 seconds, Chifali will play a little faster perhaps. So I've got this uneven data in the time domain. But if I take the FFT of that, the fast Fourier transform, I'm going to get an even size sample vector now. So I'm replacing my time domain signal with the fast Fourier transform data signal or wavelet signal. And then I go use those instead in my x space rather than my time domain signals. You can use, when you get your FFT, so what's happened is here in the raw data, here's me playing a song with a period of time and it looks like that. And then someone else goes and plays it and it looks similar, but their song is a little bit shorter. The next person goes because it has a slower pace. If I take that and get the FFT, my FFT will show the so show spectra, and the next person's FFT will look very similar to that, but it will be exactly the same duration. So I've gone and replaced a variable time domain signal with my FFT transformation of that data, and then I go take various features from the FFT and create my X matrix. I may take the total integrated area under that peak at that particular, um, at that particular uh, what's it called in the FFT? Uh, they modeled against a, a phase angle. And then you will take uh, the, the uh, mean height, perhaps, or the area, or the amplitudes, and so on. And you create an X matrix of features. So one column here might be column number one might be the total time it took me to play it and the next person and the other person. Column two will be the integrated area under this particular peak and column three will be the integrated area under the next peak. So you extract and try to convert your raw data over to an X matrix that consists of features which you can calculate for every single sample and then you may or may not, depending on the situation, have a Y just to see here, you'll have a, a, an X matrix of features, and you go use that in your data analysis. So I'll talk a bit more about feature extraction in the next class, um, or two classes from now, where that's very useful. Because sometimes our data here is just too overwhelming to deal with. We need to reduce it down 
and then reduce it down even further, and then we go to PCA to, to get a better understanding. Okay, so let's do a, a quick case study. If you're going to computers out, we'll talk about, about the process first, and then um, we'll look at the data. So a Cambia digest is a standard unit in the pulp and paper industry. Here's an illustration in the notes of uh, one of such a digester uh, from a company in China. And what they're interested in is this Kappa number. The Kappa number is the Y variable that comes out at the end of the process. So here's a, here's a better illustration of it. We take our wood chips. So this is just finely chopped up chips of wood that go into what, uh, this, this initial vessel where we add white liquor. So these are the reagents that we use then. We're going to try and dissolve those wood chips and, and, and uh, break the, the bonds between the solid product and to extract the fiber. Those chips and liquor then go through this uh, impregnation vessel where we're trying to impregnate the liquor into, into the gaps in, in between the chips and get right into those fibers. This next vessel is, is where all the where, where we try to break it apart. And these harsh chemicals, the liquor and bleaches and so on, they flow counter current to the wood chips. So wood chips flow from top to bottom, and out the bottom we're going to get this kappa number. Counter current to that is our our liquor, or the reagents that we're using to break down the molecules inside the natural wood fiber. That liquid is periodically extracted and, and recycled through this through the system. And the Kappa number at the end is our primary our primary specif specification for our product. For, five, for bleach paper, that number is in the low teens up to the mid-20s. For something like cardboard, which has got a lot of fibrous material that's not very well broken down. Cardboard, if you hold it really close up to your face, you can see the fibers of wood in it. Whereas paper that they like put a few principal notes on here, for example, you can barely see the wood fibers there. Those wood fibers are very well broken down. And that, that lignin content, which is what Kappa number is measuring, is, is really low. So what what the aim is 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 to understand in this data set how can we predict Kappa number? Can we Firstly, can we predict it well, and can we get a good predictive model for it? And then secondly, understand which variables in your, in your X space, so we've got a whole lot of measurements around the column over here. And uh, those are in the data set for you. We're going to try and use these various measurements, these flow rates, how fast do we feed the wood chips, how much steam do we apply to the reactor. Um, how do those affect happen now? And the problem with it is, it's quite simple. By the time we feed the wood chips in over here and they changes upstream, before we see that change coming through at the bottom, the delay is about three hours. Okay. So anyone that's taken a process control course, you know that your biggest limiting factor for good feedback control is time delay. That's the biggest limiting factor. And there's nothing we can do about it. What we would hope to do to improve our controllability of the process is be able to take the current readings right now of how fast we free the wood chips, the steam flow rate, and other variables, and make a prediction of what capital number is going to be. And then uh, we can look at that from a feedback control purpose and, and improve the process. So load up the data, and I'm not going to prompt you in any way of, of the exact order of what to do. Other than just give a few guidelines here, what we're really after is to say, can we see the relationships in the loadings and the weights plots to understand how Kappa number is related to the other variables? Now, you may not understand what all your X variables mean exactly from an engineering point of view. The names are hopefully kind of descriptive, like you'll see steam flow and chip flow rate, but there's a few variables in the data set which are acronyms and, and may not, you may not be able to interpret your loading plot as an engineer. But hopefully you'll, you'll be able to do some of that, some of the variables. What we are after here is, 
can you get a good prediction of r squared y and root mean squared error of estimation? And I'd like you to plot y as a time series plot and y hat as a time series plot. Then we're going to look at lagging the kappa number. So can we put one lag of kappa number into our x space? and try a second lag. And then think about how you would actually implement such a, a predictive model online. We'll talk a bit about that. And then finally, uh, you don't have to do this in class today. Uh, you're going to do this for homework. We're going to give you the same data set, but for a much longer time period. I think we've only got 300 time samples, I think, in this data set. There's a much larger data set from the same process. You're going to build your data set half and half. So you use half to train, half to test, and then switch it around like we discussed last class. Okay. So open up the software, the, the digester data set, and I'll walk around. You can take a break. So anyone got about two estimating root mean squared error and R squared? Yes. I just, um, so how do you see the R squared and Y squared? I think it shows up there on the right hand side. Oh, is that the Y squared? I'll have to double check. I think it is. Yeah, yeah that's usually, yeah. I know some software packages where it's called R squared Y and X separately, so it's definitely clear. But this one, I know it's R squared equals to that. I believe it is. So you could say I don't know. So R squared equals to Y squared. So R squared equals to Y now go ahead and look at the uh, load. Did you look at the loading plots? Okay, so let's let's work through this. Uh, I'm just going to go delete the outline so and then I'll show you. So final view import the model. You, did you all see the swimming and winds rising tool here at the bottom? So that's what we spoke about earlier. Uh, so if you go to the trimming and winds rising tool, you can either trim or winds rise, and you can say remove points greater than and you can give a numeric value, or you can go um, you can go change this to percentile. So you can go say remove all points greater than 95%, or remove points lower than 5%. And depending on trimming or winds arising, it will either set it to missing or it will change the data value. And then it's got a little preview option just to make sure. Okay, so I'm going to import the data, save and create a new block. Okay, while I'm here, let me just point out the different pre-processing that's available to you over here. So on the, on the right hand side is the little pre-processing window. Uh, so which one did you want to grab the first switch? One of the turns is front row. Always the last one. <laughs> okay, so there's a pre-processing block here. You can choose how you want to pre-process the variables. And you can do it then individually or, or groups at a time. So let's say I did want for some reason to change that variable's pre-processing. I can change its centering to mean centering or none. Scaling to unit variance or none. I can choose some custom scaling factor. So if I leave this as MC and UV and I go change this to a 2, it will upscale that variable to have double the amount of weight than the other variables. Or if I change to a smaller number, it can downweight it. You can do that to individual variables, or you can select groups of variables and change their custom scaling all in one go. You can apply transformations, so there's linear, log, negative logs, load, logistic, exponential, and power transformations. So let's say you do pick the power transformation, it shows you the form of it. It's going to be A times the X variable plus B to the power C. You can go set what those A, B, and C values are. So each type of transformation has its own set of parameters. And then once you've done, you have to click set, and then you'll see these will change here for you, uh, showing just to confirm to you that, that it set those. 
So it will show you those coefficients A, B, and C. And right now they're all set to no transformations. So I'm not going to change any of my variables. Okay. So I'm going to say OK. And there is my base model. Auto fit. And as you most, most of you found in the school plot, there's somewhat of a clustering. There's a couple of outliers here, but it's, this is only two components in T1, T2, and there were six components of it. So if we go to that um, SPE versus what's telling T squared part, it's quite helpful to see there's that one high T squared and high SPE outlier. And then there's a couple of outliers here. I'll probably exclude those as well. And I'll probably exclude these. Yeah, I'm, in a virtual machine. I'm running Windows on a Mac, so when I click Control, it doesn't do anything wrong. Click Control. Okay, so they have kind of selected all, all of those. I, I should go and investigate all of them in contribution plots and so on. That would be the correct thing to do. I'm not going to do that here right now. Then I go to the garbage can, exclude those. X block and Y block is still the same as before. I can say OK. This is OK, so model 2 now with auto fit five components and then slightly different R squareds and to what was shown up there. Well, this time on my model, I get 62.8% R squared. On my root mean squared error of estimation, which I pick up on the observed versus predicted plot, is 1.81. So I slightly different numbers to those, but you should have to go into the plot. Uh, what's interesting, let's just take a look here, just turn these labels off to help you see a bit more clearly what's going on. Uh, so that root mean squared error of estimation, 1.8 units, is saying that there's a band here of about two times 1.8. So 1.8 is kind of one standard deviation. So two times that's about three point something. There's a band kind of around here within which most of your predictions lie. So if I go up three units this way, and three units that way, that will be um, where I find most of my data lying between. And on a scale that ranges between 12 at the low end and 28 at the upper end, 1.8 may or may not be good enough for my process, right? As, a, as an engineer, I, that from this process, I may have a better sense whether 1.8 is good or bad. I, 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 I can't tell whether 1.8 as a prediction error is any good. What I do know is that this is my root mean squared error estimation. So in practice, when I apply this model in the future, it can only get worse. Now, this is the root mean squared error estimation from building your model. But when you try it on future prediction data, uh, which you can do by leaving out half the data set, and then filling it to the other half, and then switching that around and calculate root mean squared error of prediction, will, will be higher um, for, for that. What is also important to look at is the loadings plot. That was the other aspect of this project, of this case study rather, is to understand the relationships of the variables to Kappa number. The reason is this company had a really tough time controlling the variability in the Kappa number. So if you look at observed versus predicted, it ranges from 12 on the low end to 25 on the high end. That was too much variation for them. Their specification for Kappa number was obviously much tighter. So if you look at this particular loading plot, what would you say if Kappa number, your output from your, your process, let's take a look at it as a black box, with several inputs. So we've got lots of X's here, and we've got our Kappa number Y. And we're saying the variability in this Kappa number, in other words, it's the spread by plot Kappa number as a histogram, is, is too wide. I would like to bring that distribution in so it's much more, much more narrower. What are the inputs into my model, into this black box or my process, that I can adjust to try and change Kappa number? So, 
for chip level four, right? And that's positively correlated with capital. Right. So higher chip levels, this is the feed rate of the wood chips into the digest. The higher, the higher that level is, the higher my capital number is. That makes sense. I'm, I'm loading up my, my system faster, pushing more chips through the process. There's less time for the reactor to try and break down the lignin, and I get a higher capital number coming out. Anything else? So you could operate at lower chip levels, or you could try and keep your chip level feed rate constant in order to keep capital number constant is, is, is what, that answer, what we're looking at, right? So if we want to reduce the variability of capital number, we can reduce the variability with which we load chips into our process and keep that more consistent. Any other X variables that we could consider? chips. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is as well, but if it is, if it's something that we can adjust or control, that would be fair game. Anything else? Carolyn? I'm um, not getting the same graph. You're not getting the same graph? Okay. But if you saw this plot, anything? I know you're sitting a bit far back. Pavan, anything that you would recommend looking at also? Um, look at the steam flow, like, on the right. All the way up here, steam flow. Yeah, that's right. Chip moisture. Chip moisture is unlikely something that we can adjust. We we'll probably just get our wood chips with a certain amount of moisture from whoever supplying us. But the steam flow is definitely within our ability to control. So that's this is negatively correlated with the capital number. Lower steam flows get us higher capital number. That makes sense. We're putting less energy into the process. We're less able to break down these wood chips. Higher steam flows, we're going to get lower capital. But if we control the rate of steam into our process, we can probably do a better job of controlling the variation. So soft sensor models, when I look at soft sensors, yeah, yes, I, I kind of said a little bit earlier, but we just do whatever it takes in the X space, add transformations and scaling, whatever it takes to improve your Y predicted, but also spend some time looking at the understanding side, because that's where you're going to make a, a, quite a bit of an impact. Right? In this company, it wasn't so much the capital numbers absolute value, but the fact that they were all over the map with it, and they wanted to reduce that variation. That was what got them a lot of benefit as well, in addition to being able to predict why. Okay, so now add a lag to the X space. Let me show you how to do that for the first lag, and then we'll, sorry, was there a question? No, no question. Uh, I'll add a lag to the X space, and then um, we'll see how much RMSEE and R squared Y improves, if any. And we'll also take a look at the updated loadings plot. So add one lag and two lags for capital number. And then while you're doing that, I want you to think, how would you implement a model where you actually use your Y variable in your X space? Any variable that's strongly correlated to capital number would be fake, would be variables. Now obviously, variables that are correlated here positively with capital number and variables over here that are correlated with negatively with capital number, those would be the ones to consider. But not every one of those variables can be manipulated. Right? Chip moisture is just a property of the chips we get. But steam flow is something we can adjust. And chip level is the rate at which we, we, we keep the level in the chips, which is proportional to how fast we feed them. That was just two loadings. There are actually five in this model, right? So we looked at W star one and two. We can also look at the coefficient plot. Um, and I'm going to uncheck the sort descending. What this shows us is the same information, but actually looking at all five components. We could go look at W star two and three, W star one versus three. But the coefficient plot is giving us similar information over all five components. And here we see chip rates showing up again, positively correlated as we expected. We've seen this VFCM ratio, which I'm not sure what it is, but that's strongly negatively correlated. If this is a variable we can manipulate, this is definitely something we can look at to reduce variability of capital. The flow of white liquor lagged by four hours. 
and then the flow of black liquor, black flow lag by two hours. So the, the last number here represents the data have actually been pre-lagged. The engineers know roughly how many time, time steps from chip level has been lagged by four hours <clears throat> because the chip level takes roughly four hours to affect the cap number at the end. So this data has been pre-lagged, <coughs> making it easier for, for the X-rays. But we're going to lag now the Y variable. The way you do that is just to come here to model, new model as model 2. And under the lags tab, you have to be a little bit careful here because we want the lag to appear in the X space. Okay, so make sure that that block up there is your original X block. It may, you may not have X in yours, you may have whatever the name of the CSV file was that you imported it as. So let that appear and then choose Y kappa. This was a variable that was excluded from the X space, but it's still available for us to lag from. You want to lag that by one time unit. So push that over and it will tell you it's going to take that variable, lag it by one time unit. If you lag, if you want to lag, say, one, two, three, four, five, and six time units, you can put one dash six. When you click that, it will lag that variable six times. So there will be six new columns created in your X space of that lag variable. Now you can go group them and you can choose block scaling over here. So it will lag them and block scale that group down. I don't want to do that just yet. I just want to lag once. So lag one. Um, say okay. okay. So I'll let you go ahead and do that and, and let me know what your root mean squared error estimation and R squared is on the No, because I created this model from the last good model. I said new model as and I copied the model. Yeah. Can we maybe lag the capital value and we lag surrender max? No, I like, like the cap of that. Yeah. I'm lagging the Y. I'm pushing a Y variable into my X space. Yeah. Overfitting. It's just it's just saying that during cross validation it seems to have positive, sometimes negative coefficients, which is why you get that mean span of zero. So I mean you can we use that as a control for removing one of the experiments. You can. Um, just when it comes to removing X variable, one thing you have to be careful about is you have to be sure that that X variable is never going to be useful to you in the future. Particularly monitoring models of the soft cells. Sometimes yes, you exclude an X that's not useful now to build your model. But from a monitoring purpose, it will actually be a useful variable in your contribution model in the future. So it may not vary a whole lot, it may not have a strong receiving coefficient, but if it is going to be useful in the future, you should buy it. You're going to use the power of optimization. Sure. Yeah. In, in Sorry. You don't want to have that coefficient change because that means it will be right? Yeah, it's telling you that it's seeing different ways that that variable is influenced. We're sort of going to some other that in the next session. Yeah. Great, so 1.5 R is E and your R squared Y. Just found 69.8. Oh, model 4. 1.55. Your Y, what's the And 0.77. Sorry, I give you the R squared for the entire model. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Here's the one. Who gets, uh, what, well, what is your RMSE for the other people? 1.58, 1.6. 1.7. Oh, so yeah, the main thing is that it has improved. Oh, yeah, it has improved. 
by adding the lag in, it's increased somewhat. I have r squared y, 67, 68. Okay. So, and you should see uh, as well that when you look at your new loadings plot, it uh, that lag shows up in the loadings as well. So I'm going to go fit my model here with one lag. I said new model as, so it's got the reduced number of observations from those previous outliers that we have been left excluded. By auto fit, I get four components instead of five this time. And I get 67.9% for my R squared, and my observers are predicted gets an RMSE of 1.68. Yeah, we've got 1.55, but we've got, got a really good R and E. Um, and then if you look at your, your, like I said, if you look at your coefficient plot, or you could look at your W stars, but notice how strong the weight is on the coefficient plot is now for that lag. Okay. And does this coefficient sign make sense? such a slow moving process that if my Kappa number now is, is, is whatever it is and then one hour later it's going to be very close to it, they're going to be positively correlated. You'll only see a negative correlation with, with the lag when the variable in the time series is hopping around backwards and forwards. But if it's a very slow moving smooth process, it's totally expected that this is a large positive coefficient. Yeah, question. question. Um, so in the software, does your X matrix has uh, Y kappa in it already? No, you must take Y kappa out. Okay. And then when you're lagging it, you're... Oh, yeah, I guess I just didn't see that. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a little thing. It's very easy with the software to include your Y variable in your A space. Because that's, that's how your X space is all the data that you import, including your Y. You have to create your Y block and go exclude Y from your X block. No, 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 I, I did. Oh, okay. And then I'm just saying, when you want to lag Y, the only place Y kappa shows up is in the Y block. So does that No, it still shows up in your X block. If you go to lags and in that little drop down. So if I go, let me go build my model now with two lags. I go model new as, and I choose my last model. New as. If I go to the lagging tab, I make sure that under those blocks I go back to my X block. And Y kappa was still there. Even though it was excluded, it's still available to pick as a variable to lag. It's not going to be used in the model. Oh, how did you get Y? How did you? Okay, I'll have to see how you imported the data. Okay, so let's go add uh, a second lag now. So I'm going to keep lag 1 and lag 2 in my X space. Add that in, say OK, and say let's like 2. And if I fit that model now, I see still four components. My R squared is roughly, you know, it's actually gone down a little bit, 67.1. And root mean squared error of estimation is 1.69. So what did I get before? 1.68. Not a very big difference with that. It's actually a slight, a slight deterioration in the same lab. Let's see if I did that again. Okay, so if I look at my coefficient plot now with both lags, here's my first lag and my second lag, it's almost no way. After the first lag, we really don't have any more information in that y variable um, that's related to the data. Now, question on how to implement this in practice. So, here's my my uh, my 
my tower, and I'm measuring Kappa number over there at the bottom. And I've got several X's coming in as theta. And in my POS model, I know that I need Kappa lag one time unit and my X's, which have been pre-lagged by, by a certain number of hours. Let's assume those are taken care of. So in my in my X new vector that I'm going to apply to my PLS model, and from X new, I eventually want to get Y hat of this kappa number. One of my columns in my X space, that last column, is actually the kappa number and one time sample back. Okay, so how would you implement this in practice? Because you're, you're trying to predict something that you need as an input variable. from one hour ago. But when you build the model, what does that column actually contain? It's a known value. It's a measured value from the lab, right? So you would by realize by incorporating lags into your Y space, into your X space rather, you need to be able to ensure that you can actually get that data into your X space in time. So you need to make sure that the latency from taking a sample here, sending it to the lab, getting the analysis back from the lab, and for the laboratory staff to enter it into the database is less than one hour. So that come one hour in the future, this variable is actually available and known so that you can use it to predict Y kappa. You might try to get away with leaving that as missing. Okay, I wouldn't do what you suggested and, and use the prediction from the previous hour. Um, unless you actually built your model that way, which would be a really recursive type model to build. I don't, I don't know how you do that. But um, I, the, sub, the, the next best thing is just to leave that blank and let, leave it as missing data and let the PLS model figure it out. The problem is you'll find with missing data handling is if this variable is so strong to the model and is now left as missing, that your predictions become kind of weaker. So that's something you'd have to measure. So I'll have you do that in the assignment. No, actually, I, I won't have you do that in the assignment because it will require you to code it up. So but if you're looking at it as for a course project, that might be an interesting topic as well. Um, from missing data handling, what happens to missing data handling when a really important vector, high VIP, if you plot the VIP of, these, uh, of this model, let's take a look quickly. Model, analyze variable importance plot using four components. So my highest VIPs are kappa lag by one time step, the steam heat flow lag by three hours, and the white flow and the steam flow four hours. Let's say one or two of these variables went missing simultaneously. What would the quality of my PLS predictions be? Okay. And that's, that, there's a, there is a paper on missing data which talks a little bit about this, but it would make a good course project for someone interested in, in what are the effects of missing data uh, when an important variable goes missing. Uh, you'll probably find that this prediction deteriorates quite substantially. So if your lab is unable to get that, that measured value to you within a one hour time frame, you're gonna to have to resort back to this previous model uh, with no lag. So that model had a slightly higher RMSEB at a slightly lower R squared, but that if you can't get the lab value in time, that's what you've got to do. Just a general question. How come when uh, you make that fourth model, when you add in the second line, what do you need the data point? Oh, and I never, I never I mentioned it in the slides. Um, it's kind of this is, guess. Uh, if you look back here at lagging, if I take my original X matrix and my Y matrix, how it lag Y. I have two options. I can either leave, keep this first row in and have a missing value in that spot. Or I, what the software often does is, oh sorry, that, that, it does that. I should, I should correct this drawing. Actually this drawing is a little bit correct. These blue lines should go up all the way to the top there. Because what happens is that the software just leaves that value as missing. But this bottom row cannot be filled in. There's only one value there. So it, it deletes this. That doesn't explain it. No, that, yeah, if I shift this up, that's still N. 
Yeah, so I guess what the software is doing is doing what I've shown here. So this is correct. The blue lines are correct. The software is just deleting this entire top row, so you have one pure observation. I actually haven't paid too much attention to what the software is doing. I'm just curious. No, no, no. no, no, you're right. Okay, so 295 observations for the model with, with no lags. 295 observations and then 294, yeah. I, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know when it decides to delete a row, but that's where it comes from. It's deleting either the top or the bottom row. I have to figure out which. Yeah, okay, I haven't paid attention to it. Okay, so 